When Bill Vigors and Martha, who almost tackled me at Raleigh Fato's funeral a few weeks ago, <laughs> asked me to come and speak here, my, my initial reaction was no. <laughs> 25 hours of sitting, driving to the airport, waiting for the flight, cramped in a plane, Traveling from Chilliwack, B.C. to here and back was a depressing thought for somebody like myself who likes to exercise about three hours a day. <laughs> Bill told me to pray about it. When did Bill get religious? <laughs> <laughs> so I did pray, reluctantly. And the thought kept coming to me that my sacrifice of a few days of travel across the country was so small compared to the thousands of hours many of you have given over the last 36 years to carrying on Terry's dream. I am honored to be here, and as Terry said, I am just one member of the Marathon of Hope. The miracle of Terry Fott's a gift to us. In September 1979, with the help of, a, of his girlfriend, Rika, Terry wrote the following letter asking for sponsorship help to finance the Cross Canada run. To whom it may concern, the night before my amputation, I decided to meet this new challenge head on and not only overcome my disability, but conquer it in such a way that I could never look back and say it disabled me. But I soon realized that would only be half my quest. As I went through the draining ordeal of chemotherapy, I was rudely awakened by the feelings in the cancer clinic. There were the faces with the brave smiles and the ones who had given up smiling. There were the feelings of hopeful denial and the feelings of despair. My quest would not be a selfish one. Somewhere the hurting must stop and I am determined to take myself to the limit for this cause. In 1968, when Terry and I were 10 years old, we first met on the POCO, POCO is short for Porco Quitlam, Pacers Track and Field Club. The lady who had started the club, Elaine Haynes Kramer, was always trying to invent things. Her fa father, Donald Hings, had been given the Order of Canada for inventing the walkie-talkie in 1937. <laughs> Elaine had over 20 patents herself, and inventing something out of Terry and I became one of her goals. <laughs> Elaine believed Terry and I could do the impossible. Elaine was an optimist. <laughs> At age 10, we were 4 foot 4 inches tall and 70 pounds. In club track and field competition records, I am listed in several running races. There is no mention of Terry <laughs> and, until you go to the field section. There it was, T. Fott, shot put, third place. <laughs> Terry didn't like running events. He often came last. Grade 8 was the year Terry and I got to know each other well when we entered junior high. Terry lived in North... Poco, three kilometers away from me, and South Poco, where the junior high was located. Every day, Terry jogged the three kilometers across town to go to school. Our phys ed teacher, Bob McGill, was a real motivator. Bob was also the school football coach, and Terry and I wanted to play football. <laughs> coach McGill took one look at us, at our four foot ten, 88 pound bodies, and shook his head. <laughs> Football, not a good idea for two sparrow-chested guys like you. I still remember those words. <laughs> we were the only, t uh, and Bob suggested, or in those days a suggestion was an order. If you didn't go out for what he told you to do, he, may, you may, he might fail you in your phys ed class. <laughs> we were the only two grade eights on the cross-country running team. In our first three-kilometer race, Terry and I battled it out in a mad sprint at the finish. And I edged Terry out. <laughs> he never did beat me in running. <laughs> For 29th place. <laughs> there were 30 grade eights in the race. <laughs> Terry was last. That's a true story. <laughs> 
Our cross country coach was a brand new teacher, Fred Tink. Brand new teachers often get sent to do the extracurricular things after school. Well, Coach Tink knew little about running, so he'd research in the library about training programs for Olympians. <laughs> for three years, he tortured us. Well, with encouragement. And as Terry says in Leslie Scrivener's biography, Coach Tink would often say at the end of the workout, way to go men. And when you've been called scrawny chested <laughs> grade eights, that was quite a compliment. <laughs> Coach Tink had a way of motivating us to endure torture. By age 15, I was ranked as the third best cross-country runner for my age in Canada. Thank you. I just want to mention Glamina's here. Three years ago I was in Toronto. I think it was a twist of fate because I was invited by Raleigh and Daryl and the Walk of Fame to come to Toronto for the induction ceremony and for Terry into the Walk of Fame. And uh, I thought, oh, gee, I'm in the best shape of my life. I wanted to go in this race in Vancouver. Well, by coincidence of the morning of the Walk of Fame ceremony, they were having the National Age Class Championships here in Toronto. And uh, Glamina got up at like probably 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning in the pouring rain to come and pick me up at the Four Seasons Hotel to take me to the race. And a dream of mine since uh, being a kid was to be a national age class champion. And there were 43 guys in my age class running here in Toronto. I'd won the BC championship. And this is the first time I'd had to run in the nationals. And I won. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gomina. You know, I was going to say there, Terry got the same training I did, but for some, some reason he didn't improve as much as I did because I think he must have swallowed all those steel shot puts he threw for the Poco <laughs> Pacers. He had, he had steel in his legs, so, but he, he improved a lot as a runner. And if it wasn't for those three years in junior high running, which he didn't really like to do, he would never have had the base to do what he did running across Canada. So thanks to Bob McGill for calling us two sparrow chested <laughs> grade eights. <laughs> Academically, I remember three months into our grade eight year, the honor roll being posted outside the school office. And Terry looked at that list hopefully. I still look, remember the gleam in his eye, but he could not find his name. Three months later, after another term, the next honor roll list, and there it was, Terry Fotts, his name was, he'd made the honor roll, second from the bottom. And then every year after that, every semester right through high school, he kept climbing the list. And in his final year of high school, taking the hardest physics and biology courses he, he could, he basically had straight A's and he got one B in English only because he picked the toughest English teacher in the school <laughs> so he'd be prepared for university. Terry and I both loved basketball. In grade eight, I was the first string guard as I had four older brothers and sisters who had taught me to play the game. Terry was the fifth string guard, <laughs> meaning he never got in a game as his skills were so poor. <laughs> there are only five strings. <laughs> and it isn't an exaggeration to say he was the 25th best player on a 25-man team. The coach had a policy that if you showed up for practice and worked hard, he wouldn't cut you. And Terry worked hard. He was an ideal team member as he was what you call coachable, teachable. When the coach taught him something, he would come in at 7 in the morning and practice before school at lunchtime and at practice after school. I never once heard Terry complain about never getting into a real game in his grade 8 and 9 years. By his last year of high school, Terry was the first string guard. And an amazing everybody, he went on to make the team at Simon Fraser University. 
In March of 1977, Terry had his right leg amputated above the knee. I remember visiting Terry in the hospital during this time and was amazed at his attitude. Terry always seemed to embrace setbacks as a setup to challenge him to do something better. In March of 1979, two years after the amputation and months of grueling chemotherapy, Terry phoned me about how to train for a cross-Canada run for cancer research. Terry and I were both very naive 20-year-olds. The only info we had on amputee running was from a Runner's World magazine article on Dick Trom, who had done the New York City Marathon and was the world record holder. I made one suggestion to Terry, start slow at 100 meters a day and by one year, 365 days times 100 meters, you'd be up to almost a marathon a day. And you can do that for any goal you have in life. We thought it would take two to three years or more to get the body trained to run far enough each day to make it across the entire country before winter. As a runner or an athlete, you have to work through the injuries, adapting the body to the stress. A few months later, Terry was running, hopping, jumping, Terry Fox, trot, whatever you want to call that thing, eight kilometers a day. Walking was not allowed. For Terry, it had to hurt. His attitude was the kids in the hospital are suffering all the time. I have to suffer too. I remember Terry and I sitting on the back steps of my parents' home that my dad had built in July of 1979. I had an entry form for the Prince George to Boston Labor Day Classic where the winner got to go to the world famous Boston Marathon. There were two races, an eight and a half mile, 14 kilometer, or a 17 mile, 28 kilometer. And Terry said, enter me in the 14 kilometers, because at that time, in July, he was up to eight kilometers. And for some reason, I don't know why, to this day, I said, why don't you enter the 28 kilometers? <laughs> Boy, was I naive. But, and there was silence. And Terry, a minute later, said, you're right. I should enter the 28 kilometers. That's a bigger challenge. If we're going to drive 800 kilometers to a race, I'll, I should go for it. So I entered Terry in the 28 kilometer. And I entered myself and Terry's brother, Daryl, in the 14 kilometer. <laughs> I, I felt guilty on the drive all the way up, and <laughs> at the last minute, I switched to the 17, <laughs> or the 17 mile. So, I can't, I, I don't know, this is a twist of fate that I said that, uh, a, a slip of the tongue, I don't know. Um, as Brita McClue says, sometimes things are destiny, because if I hadn't talked him into doing the 28 kilometers, he would not have felt he was ready to get ready to run across Canada in 1980 because on the way back in the car, we both looked at each other and said, next spring in 1980, we're going to try. And that's when he really upped his training load to get ready for the run. When I realized what I had volunteered for in driving a little camperized van across Canada. I must have asked Terry a half a dozen times from that race in September to the time we left in April, you can't find anybody else, can you? <laughs> <laughs> nope, Terry said, you're it. <laughs> My only plane trip before was a 40-minute plane trip with his Cub Scouts at age 10 where I had my head in a barf bag after five minutes after takeoff. <laughs> the trip to St. John's took 40 hours, nine takeoffs with several rocky landings. A note in Terry's journal, April 7, 1980. The first segment of the flight from Vancouver was the scariest. Our plane was shaking like a jackrabbit as we weaved through the mountains. 
When Doug and I arrived in St. John's, it was a relief. It was good to get off those planes. We were dead tired. We weren't flying back. I was I'm just going to show some um, pictures here from Douglas Copeland's book, Terry. And, you know, you might just think that's just a bunch of uh, scribble. But if you look on the top, minimum, right on the very top there above the January 28th, you'll see must run a minimum of 10 miles per day. Now this is midwinter. It's not too bad in BC, but it still gets below zero a lot in snow in some days. And Terry is a real scientist. He took all sciences at university, and he is really analytical about his training. And training, he got all advice from the experts at SFU on what they could tell him about training for running on one leg, which nobody in the world had ever run that far before. Uh, we were so naive at the time. Dick Trom, we'd seen the magazine article, and we had no idea how fast he'd run. It wasn't until about five years ago when I was looking up the progression of amputee world records that I realized Terry probably could have broken the world record by three hours in the marathon. We just had no idea. We just thought there was lots of amputees out there running, but it was basically considered impossible to continually run that far with the hop and the pressure on the leg. Um, even when Dick Trom did it, there's videos showing he, he could run for a stretch, but then the stress was so much you'd have to walk for a bit. So it was a walk, run, walk, run. Well, Terry, he just thought he ran all the way. So that's what he did. He had to train to do that. And when he started at 100 meters, it was tough. But Terry just, he wouldn't give up. And that's... Uh, Line two up at 9.15 a.m. Here he's, a month before he was finishing all his university courses, he spent the last few months totally concentrating on training for the run. So I, I think he might have taken one university course in this last semester before the run. Eight granola and toast. Well, what he's trying to figure out there is what can I eat that will give me the energy for my run for the day so I know what to eat on the run without upsetting my stomach. Uh, his first run at 10 a.m., 15 miles. Can you imagine that in freezing cold weather? That's 24 kilometers. Um, the next, um, and he writes down there, extremely cold. Then the next thing you know, he's out the door again to do another eight miles at 2.30. That's 23 miles in training in a day. Uh, I, I, it's just unfathomable on two legs, to be honest with you. You think that's enough for the day. A couple lines down, he's got weight training. Well, he used to go up to Simon Fraser University. They had special apparatus machines. Today, a, a big thing in athletics, no matter what the sport, you've got to develop your core muscles in here and the back. And Terry is like 36 years ahead of his time, really, because I, I remember some of the apparatus he worked on, he'd basically be laying on a tiny little pedestal thing on his stomach, lifting his back up, because the stress on his back when he ran was so incredible that he had to have incredible muscular strength to withstand the pressure. That's all one day. You go down a couple lines for basketball at 9 p.m. Well, he had to drive an hour into North Vancouver because he was playing on the Vancouver cable cars with Rick Hansen, the man who went, went around the world in a wheelchair. They trained, the only time they could get the gym North Van was 9 o'clock at night, so they trained from 9 to 11 on wheelchair basketball, and here he's already done 23 miles that day, the weight training for an hour, and then wheelchair basketball. I, I just find that un unbelievable. You go to 
January 29th, and you think, what's that first line? That's Second Chronicles 24. For those you know, that's part of the Bible. And this is something Terry is very private with Terry. I, I know he had a Bible in the van because I found out in some of his journal entries after what he'd read that day. I never, I don't know where he hid it, but he's obviously very uh, concerned about developing himself spiritually and mentally too. And I was in a conversation with Bill on the plane. Somehow it came up on the run of uh, Terry getting into the conversation with somebody who said, uh, do you ever take a day off, maybe to go to church on Sunday? And Terry said, I read the Bible twice through. It's three quarters of a, a million words, if you've ever read the Bible. Uh, I don't know of too many 21 years olds who've read the Bible once. I still haven't read it twice. But <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he, it was a very strong, Terry had a very strong spiritual side. Now this, this is a bunch of my scribble from the run. Well, in those days, calculators cost a fortune. I think in today's dollars, a calculator, I figured it out, it would be about $500 for a calculator in today's dollars back then. That's one of the things that has changed over the years. You can, you can get a solar powered one now. We used to have to have a plug in one that did only half the number of functions. And so I, th thankfully, I was good at algebra. Right? Or, you know, I could do numbers pretty good. So uh, the problem was Terry wanted everything in miles. Well, the van we got, it was right around the time they changed from miles to kilometers. And it's 16, or 1.6094 <laughs> kilometers per mile. So I'm, I was always calculating the whole trip to make sure Terry had done his marathon that day because he is fanatical about his mileage, eh? Can we go to the next picture? Oh, you threw that in. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's just me and Terry and me. <laughs> 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 just you and Terry. Oh, I threw that one in too. <laughs> and there's Daryl with uh, Terry. And we, on the, uh, we got a mileage thing on the sign. So every mile or so, Daryl would hop out or I would hop out of the van and we change the mileage. I only had five pictures there. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you spent 143 days. Oh. Yeah, okay, I know. Ed, that was your view. <laughs> 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 oh, I think that's it. I threw that one in. Okay. There, there was one picture I wanted to mention. It was a picture of a pink waste paper basket. Oh, yeah. And... Shoot, I'm sorry, guys. I yeah, took my one out to put the other one. No, I scanned it. It was kind of... In a way, it was a sad picture. And a lot of people weren't aware of this, but... You know, they had the telethon after the run had ended, and they'd raised, like, $25 million dollars. And nobody thought to ask Terry, do you have any money to buy Christmas presents? And there's a, a fellow who had been a huge promoter of, uh, right even before Terry had started the run, his name was Doug, Douglas Vader, a businessman in Port Coquitlam, who had done a tremendous job promoting the fundraising in Porco, even be, Poco, even before Terry had started, who was sitting at, with Terry in his living room when Terry had come home from the hospital, and he said, do you need anything? And Terry, this is only a week or so before Christmas, and Terry said, I haven't got any money to buy any Christmas presents. A lot, a lot of people, because Terry said he was fanatical that every dollar had to go to the cancer fund. 
And I know that pink waste paper basket is the last Christmas present he got for his mother that she treasured forever. Do we got the little bit of audio tape? This is an in, uh, interview Terry had done at, uh, with a reporter sure, uh, at, around Christmas after the run had ended where he didn't know if he was going to live or die. It's just a short clip. Do you think it's hard? Yeah, I do. A lot of my attitudes, I, I, I gave attitude because I, I read the Bible. And, he, and now, right now, it's playing a lot major role because... I've got, as you know, I've got, I was told I had 10% chance to live. I'm going through a lot of hard times now, and I've got to face it. I've got to face it. Uh, if, I, if, I, if it comes to the point where I'm told I'm going to die of cancer, I haven't got a chance. I've got to be able to face that and, and accept it. You know, I, I know I might die of cancer, and if I do, you know, if I, if I don't, and if I'm able to beat it, and I get back to Thunder Bay, well, that'll be great. I really think it'll be a great. Great, you know, you know, people are really psyched up. But uh, if, I, if it doesn't work out that way, I've also got to be able to accept it. And I think that uh, by having some faith that God is there, there um, that, you know, believing in, in heaven is something that help, will relieve me, relieve me of that loneliness, you know. I'd like to end. Can you read I'd like to end with some of Terry's own words taken from interviews, Leslie Scribner's book. Thank you, Leslie, for coming today. Um, these are words of Terry that he said. I believe in being humble, knowing money will not make me happy. If I ever come to think of myself as better than others, there is no point in continuing. Sometimes the sores on my stump would bleed. My toes and heel were blistered raw. I lost three toenails. I had shin splints for two months. There were times it really hurt, but I kept going. Today we got up at 4 a.m. The first miles were agonizing, all uphill with 40 mile an hour winds in my face. I started to feel dizzy and was seeing eight pictures of everything. It was frightening. Was the run finished? Would I let everybody down? I told myself I would keep going. If I died, I would die happy doing what I wanted to do. I cried because I know I may die, but my spirit will not die. Thank you for participating in Terry's dream.